I know everyone's really excited to meet everyone else, which is awesome. We will have more time for that, I promise. There's a whole social after this, and then there's a whole nother social after that. So get ready, you're gonna make lots of new friends. But I'm super excited to kind of kick off today's meetup um, and introduce your agenda for today. I'm Molly, I lead the PL Endres team, which does a lot of amazing engineering, research development, and product work across IPFS, Falcoin, LibP2P, DRAND, a ton of amazing other Web3 protocols and primitives. Yeah, is that for DRAND? Go DRAND. Oh, oh, thank you. Oh. Um, your agenda for today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about IPFS in 2022. This is just a high level overview. I know a lot of people here are probably new to IPFS. Who, who are IPFS newbies who are here to learn a lot about IPFS? How it works? Okay, who are IPFS old hats who have been in the IPFS ecosystem for a while, a long time? And then, okay, 90% of people are either shy or somewhere in between. Good to know, good to know. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about that, overview some of the, the use cases, a couple of spotlights on some uh, latest progress. Then Constantine is gonna dive into how IPFS and Filecoin work, give you a, a full end-to-end -end walkthrough there. Um, and then I believe some folks from the Fluence Labs are gonna talk about the need for Web3, storage, payments, compute. It's gonna be awesome, super excited. And then we're gonna end with lightning talks. So all of you can be thinking about the awesome things that you want to come up here for, I think, one to five minutes, five minutes, demo, show off a project you're working on, building on top of Web3, on top of IPFS, Filecoin, some of the cool technologies we have here. Um, and so we'll, we'll end with that and then go into social, lots more time to meet the other people in this room, which will be great. Cool, so my agenda for talking about IPFS in 2022, first high level overview for those newbies in the room, what is IPFS, what are we even doing here? Um, talk a little bit about IPFS case studies, the use cases for IPFS, um, and then talk about a couple of prog progress spotlights of some of the, the latest metrics and some of the exciting progress that's happening um, in the IPFS project and community. So first, the mission of IPFS is to create a resilient, upgradable, open network to preserve and grow humanity's knowledge. We're very inspired by building an internet that is resilient to all sorts of faults, that is empowering to its users and humanity, and something that we can build a foundation for our future growth um, and projects on top of. Um, IPFS is aiming at making the web work peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, that means that instead of having a central kind of client-server model like HTTP, IPFS interconnects nodes resiliently so that even when, say, a couple of nodes go offline in our wider swarm, they can still interoperate and share data between each other and continue to, uh, to connect and, and use their application smoothly. Um, IPFS is built on the foundations of content addressing. That's really the core of what IPFS does. It allows you to build applications that are content addressed. You might want to use this for a whole ton of reasons. We'll go into use cases in a second. Um, but th this enables the smooth way of, of, say, storing an NFT or building a blockchain-powered dApp um, or otherwise making sure that you can resiliently address your content regardless of where it's stored in a network. Um, IPFS aims to address a whole ton of problems in this space. Um, this can be useful for censorship, making sure that many people in a community can host and preserve data that's useful. This can be useful for offline local first collaboration so that all of us in this room can use Birdie and chat with each other regardless of whether or not our cell service or internet go out. Um, this helps avoid links breaking because you address the data by its content instead of where it's hosted. So even when data moves around a network or the original provider of data goes offline, you can still find and address that content resiliently. Um, it has a better security model. You can validate that the thing you are fetching is the thing you meant to gather. If uh, Facebook decides to return you a cat video that's not the cat video you thought you were linking to, kind of SOL. But with IPFS, you can validate that the CID that you uh, meant to be retrieving matches the content that you are served back from other peer nodes, which enables all of that peer-to-peer -peer goodness. Um, it's more efficient. If you already have content locally that you can fetch and cache, you know that that content is there, you don't have to go back and refetch it from you know, your central Google Drive server, which was my pain point and why I got excited about IPFS, was building all of these tools for teachers and students, and they were super inefficient because we had to load every single YouTube video in a room of 30 students over and over and over again despite the teacher already having it cached locally on their computer at the front of the screen. Um, and finally, they can be really useful in emerging networks. There's amazing teams like um, 
Huddle who are building video and, and collaboration tools that work better in uh, communities like India schools where they're trying to um, enable teachers and students to work well with each other, actually. Um, and so this can actually be much more empowering in, in areas with less robust infrastructure. Um, an example that I love for how IPFS works versus how uh, kind of the central location addressed model tends to work um, is this great example that I think comes from early days of, of the IPFS community, um, which, which is uh, imagine that someone has told you to go and read a book, um, but they haven't told you what book it is. They've told you, by the way, um, you should go to the New York Public Library, section nine, bookcase three, top shelf, first from the left, that's where you're gonna find this book. And so you have to go all the way there, travel to New York, maybe the library's closed, you gotta wait a day, you go and you fetch it, and you look at the book and you realize, oh wait, I had that book in my backpack the whole time. And you just didn't know because you didn't know the content of the book that you were looking for. You couldn't actually address it and identify it by what it was. You had to know where, where you had to go look for it. Um, and so this IPFS enables a much more resilient model of finding content. Um, IPFS is, is not really one thing. I describe it as actually a trench coat surrounding some other really amazing building blocks and protocols within Web3, um, namely libp2p and ipld, which are some of the really critical, useful, um, like other primitives that make IPFS actually work. So libp2p is the content address, or sorry, libp2p is the peer-to-peer -peer networking stack that's used by IPFS, and also a ton of blockchains you know probably pretty well, like Filecoin, Ethereum2, Polkadot, others. Um, and IPLD is the content addressing module of IPFS. It's the data model by which we actually describe uh, in a self-describing way all of this, this content addressable data. Um, and so if you actually think about the, the work that's being done in the space, there's actually many layers, each of which you can use by yourself. So if you really just want uh, you know, fu future-proof, upgradable um, addresses, you can use multi-formats. If you want peer-to-peer -peer networking, you can use libp2p. And you can use each of these things without using the layer above it in the stack. So it's built in kind of a modular way um, that, that fits kind of overall enabling higher and higher order use cases um, as you go up. Um, I mentioned a little bit about libp2p. It's amazing, it's a growing project. If you're excited about libp2p, please come join us next week in Paris at Paris P2P. There's gonna be a ton of great talks about the latest in the libp2p ecosystem. There are six, maybe more actually, I think at this point, over six, maybe seven implementations of libp2p in different languages that are powering many of the different Ethereum 2 clients. Um, it's really the networking, peer-to-peer -peer networking library of Web3 and powers um, many of the amazing blockchains we know and love. And it's also itself built in a modular way so that you can pick and choose the different sub-modules kind of in a library style fashion that you want to use and depend on for your own particular use case in libp2p. Um, and IPFS uses this very, very heavily at scale um, with you know, hundreds of thousands of nodes all interoperating and being peer-to-peer -peer connected with each other at all times. Um, IPLD is the other one that we talked about there, which is all about CIDs. If you depend on CIDs or use CIDs in your work, you maybe address your, uh, your NFT via its CID, its content ID, um, you're using IPLD, which uh, is really the canonical Web3 data model. Um, cool, so that's a little bit about what IPFS is. We're gonna dive into it more with Constantine next. Um, but I wanted to also give a whirlwind to tour through different use cases and case studies building on top of IPFS. Um, and there's something in this for you. If you know of someone in different categories, I'll like pause and someone can raise their hand. And then if you tell me someone who's not otherwise listed on the slide that is using IPFS for that use case, I have some really awesome shiny IPFS socks that are not on the table back there. These are new and fancy and special. And so I'll give you a pair of socks. I have six. I know that's not very many, but keep your, keep your fingers sharp. Um, cool, so some case studies. There's all of these projects, you can't even read these logos, they're too tiny, building on top of IPFS, um, who are using it in all sorts of exciting ways to push Web3 forward, and even bring some of that Web3 goodness to lots of applications we know and love in Web2. Um, some examples are actually on the IPFS and Filecoin YouTube channels. I really recommend you go and watch some of these videos. They are inspiring, they're motivating. There's just awesome teams who are building really, really cool projects. Um, Starling is working to preserve genocide testimonials. Um, Birdie is building a privacy-oriented, peer-to-peer, offline-first messaging app, which is fun. I have it on my phone. I would love to be your friend on Birdie and we can chat. Um, Audius is building one of my favorite music platforms 
period, I found way more songs on this than on Spotify that I actually love and had never heard of before. Yeah, definitely, A+. Plus. Um, and Textile is one of the, the earliest and most beloved members of the, web th the IPFS Web3 community, um, building all sorts of useful infrastructure for other developers, um, started kind of like from the top of the stack and has worked their way down, making IPFS and Filecoin much more easy to use and much easier to build applications with. So check out those videos. I'm going to dive through a couple of high-level use cases, starting with static assets. This is kind of like the first thing that people started using IPFS for. Really easy to take you know, a file or an image or something else, throw it on IPFS. Does anyone know of any tool or application that builds on top of IPFS for storing or sharing static assets? There are socks in this for you. Go for it. I don't think they build on IPFS. I don't think so. Another? Yeah? Uh, NFT.storage NFT. 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 does store static assets. Yeah. Someone, I'm, I don't have a good enough arm for this. Oh, wow. About like 60% of the way there. Pretty good. <laughs> websites. Lots of people store their websites on IPFS. This is super useful. It means that you can kind of content address and self host your website and data. Anyone know of an awesome tool that's not listed on the slide for storing in websites? It is not. Good one. Good eye. Oh, this is going to be embarrassing. I'm just a bad thrower. Um, developer assets. Lots of people put developer assets on IPFS. This means that they're versioned and they're content addressed. You can see how they change over time. And you actually can dedupe between different snapshots of, say, your code as it changes over time, which is very useful. We actually, oh, I guess I shouldn't, shouldn't mention examples. Does anyone know of anyone who's doing developer assets or tool chains or other things? Reddit? Radical, yeah. Radical is, it, I think they're technically using IPLD, but I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Another great example is Valist. Another great example is IPFS Dist. We actually use IPFS for storing and distributing new versions of IPFS itself, dog fooding, um, so that you can fetch your new version of IPFS over IPFS, which was actually very useful for different communities in China who had trouble getting access to the latest IPFS node because of the Great Firewall. This made it much easier for them to fetch the latest version of IPFS, uh, I guess, developer assets. Would the Filecoin proofs also maybe count here? They're always using IPFS, and it's actually really critical that they're stored in IPFS for that same use case, making it accessible in areas with slightly less connected internet. IPFS archives, groups who are archiving data and putting it on IPFS. It's a very notable archive. Someone might have heard of. Archive something that you use all the time. Solsify. I've not heard of that one. It's an Ethereum project? Yes, um, yeah, totally. The Internet Archive is the one I was thinking of. It archives the Internet is pretty, pretty useful, but tons of people who are archiving data and putting it on IPFS. I think I actually end up overlapping in this category because there's a lot of great groups. Yeah? Yeah, Slingshot is archiving not just um, maps data, internet archive, um, I think, yeah, a ton of open archives that are, that are putting data there. Um, another great use case is for building dApps. Um, most Ethereum dApps are building on top of IPFS so that they can content address their front end, which means that anyone can host it instead of one central party being required to stay online and keep that content accessible. Anyone name an Ethereum dApp or some other dApp? Ave, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, tons of default. Oh, I only have one pair of socks left. This is going to be. Someone said Ave. Oh, there you go. Ave is a great one. OK, this is my last pair of socks, so yeah, last one. Large scientific data sets. Um, this is huge. There's a ton of different groups, and there's a lot of ones listed on the slide, so you're not allowed to say any of those, um, who are putting their data up here. This could be for many different reasons. Um, one reason that uh, I thought was an awesome example was um, maybe you want to use your scientific data in, the f in future court cases. You want to refer to data five, 10, 15 years in the future and reference back what that data was and be able to prove that the data that you say time stamped into Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever blockchain is the same data that you're now bringing into a court of law and using to say, talk about climate change. Um, and so these are really valuable use case, cases where you might put large scientific data 
A, on a cheaper platform, I see your hand, I'm gonna call on you, um, where, where you might have large data that you wanna store on a cheap network, like Filecoin, or data that you wanna be content addressed, where you wanna be able to prove and validate and verify the data is what it says it was, and it's been proved over time to be correct um, and not changed. Anyways. That is the best, the best pair of socks example uh -huh. of making sure that we don't lose or otherwise uh, have that censored from the internet and our collective knowledge and, and history. And unfortunately out of socks, so no more examples. But as you can see, many, many great examples, many that were not listed as well, of projects that are building on top of these foundations in these different use case areas. Um, to run through a couple of more areas, um, scientific papers. I think LibGen was the one I was thinking of to, to put here if I only had more pairs of socks. Um, people who are putting open access data on top of resilient content addressing foundations that can be hosted by anyone in any area of the world. Um, music, we mentioned Audius earlier. Highly recommend it. If you have a mobile phone, you can download Audius and use it for all of your music needs. It's really fun. Um, I can share some favorite song recommendations with you. Um, video, tons of people are using IPFS um, and Filecoin for video. Video is large. Um, you, when you want to store lots of video and you want to maybe share it peer to peer in an offline setting, it's really useful to have uh, some of the Web3 primitives um, enabling, enabling that peer to peer sharing and that longer term persistence um, in, in kind of cheap long term storage. Um, some examples of groups who are doing this Videocoin, Live Peer. Huddle 01, there's tons of amazing groups doing this and need for more. There are more groups and more tools needed here in the video use case to start making video NFTs a real thing and start um, like really ramping up this use case for Web3. I think it's very fertile ground. Um, photos, of course, many people are putting photos on IPFS today, specifically a lot of NFTs. I think it's we're over 50 million, probably close to 70 million, because the last time that I checked was like three weeks ago, and it's growing really, really quickly. Um, NFTs that are stored on IPFS and Filecoin, which is awesome, um, and tons of groups that are building richer and larger and more immersive and more creative NFTs. So there's all sorts of opportunities to build new kinds of NFTs. Um, a great example being um, the folks at Mona who are building even more like awesome, immersive, metaverse, interactive, and interconnectable NFT worlds that you can then buy and own these spaces. I bet you in you know three to five years, we're going to be doing these meetups in Mona metaverse spaces built on IPFS, which is going to be so cool. Um, and so we'll get to you know experience a real metaverse, not a metaverse owned by meta, that we can actually use and build on top of and has good primitives at the baseline. Um, as we mentioned, tons of virtual world data. This is large. There's a lot. I don't know if anyone has built VR worlds here, but man, do these files get very, very large. So it's also useful to have um, good long-term storage um, and the ability to bring NFTs into different virtual worlds. So the ability to interoperate between virtual worlds and have a global addressing space where you can talk about data and reference it between different created spaces is super, super useful. So some of the content addressing primitives of IPLD uh, make a big difference there. Um, so yeah, lots of opportunity to store these virtual worlds on IPFS and Filecoin make them more interactive, building games and game assets. There are a lot of amazing groups, like Gala Games and others who are pushing forward in this area. Um, and yeah, like the, the building blocks are there. We have NFTs, we have games, we have metaverses. Like, let's go, let's go build it. Um, there's a lot of cool, cool work happening here. So if you're excited in this area, we'd love to chat with you later. Um, cool, to just progress spotlight a couple of things before I hand it off to Constantine. Um, there's some amazing, amazing work being done across the IPFS community. I wanted to, to highlight two exciting things from the metrics that I've been tracking for a long time. Um, one is there's just a ton of growth happening in the IPFS network. Um, content discovery in IPFS is getting faster and faster. Um, this was my shtick back in IP, uh, 2020, was all about trying to make the IPFS DHT faster to find content in. At the time, I think we started out at something like, an, an, like over 30 seconds at the beginning of 2020 to find content, which was infeasible. It was like not working. We spent a lot of focus within less than six months. We were able to bring that down to three seconds. Now we're down to about half a second. So that's a significant progress rate. So we you know, did 40x there. Now we're 6x versus where we were. And this is 2x faster just since the beginning of this year. 
So significant progress is being made um, thanks to a lot of the work that um, infra network infra teams are doing to help accelerate and speed up uh, content discovery in the IPFS network. Um, there's also a ton of growth in nodes in the IPFS network, um, really thanks to lots of new ways to run and host an IPFS node. Um, one that I wanted to shout out is Brave's embedded IPFS node. If you're not already using Brave, highly recommend it. It's an awesome browser. Um, but there's also this added bonus of getting to run your own IPFS node embedded in the browser. Um, and this lets you load your IPFS.io website directly using IPFS or IPNS colon slash slash, which um, is super cool and super exciting to see brow the browser layer building kind of the, the future upgrade trajectory into Web3. Um, and there's a lot of work with other browser vendors to add this additional level of support. So IPFS companion extension is already supported in almost all browsers. Um, IPFS uh, handler, handling, I guess, is already uh, supported in uh, Brave and Opera and support coming soon to, to Chromium and all other Chromium-based browsers, which is really awesome and thanks to the hard work that Agalia has been doing in the space. Um, and then we already have a full node embedded in Brave. And now the question is, which one of these amazing browsers is going to be the next one to integrate a full embedded IPFS node that gives users um, all of that kind of like ownership, ability to, to host and store data, um, and interface with the web peer-to-peer um, -peer and content addressed. Um, there is also, just to highlight this browser upgrade path that Juan has been maintaining for a long time, we've made a ton of progress, a ton faster than we could have expected. Um, but there's significant areas for future improvement, especially around mobile and mobile browsers um, and mobile OSs. And so there's a lot of work being done there right now as well to, to ramp up better support um, for IPFS on mobile. Um, one of the kind of useful things here as well is as we have more and more browser nodes, it becomes more important to make sure that any node anywhere in the network can dial and connect to any other node. So there's been a ton of work happening over the past more than a year on libp2p hole punching, making sure that you can hole punch through NATs and firewalls in order to dial a node that's, you know, maybe on the Onda's Wi-Fi like we are right now and fetch content that it's trying to host to the IPFS network. And this has now rolled out in the most recent version of, I think, yeah, both, yeah, the most recent version of IPFS now has hole punching turned on, which means that we can do signaling. There's a great, great blog post on the IPFS blog that describes all of the work that's been done and why and how this makes things so much better. Um, and so definitely recommend checking that out and or getting involved if you're excited about libp2p and helping all nodes anywhere in the world be, be connected. Um, the other progress spotlight I wanted to highlight was um, usage of things like IPFS gateways and accessing IPFS content um, over things like HTTP. This has been a massive area of growth and explosion. Um, really thanks a lot to the growth and explosion around NFTs and their he heavy usage of IPFS. Not on IPFS, not your NFT. Um, so IPFS gateway usage up over 8x uh, in the past year, which is awesome. Um, that's really just looking at the IPFS.io gateway. There's actually many gateways being run by many other parties, um, and you know they're they're all getting you know 500 million plus. Yeah, this is up 500 million requests per week in the past six months, just one gateway in that network. So we're all starting to run pretty serious infrastructure when it comes to supporting Web3 uh, adoption and usage and growth in this space. So like big, big snaps and hats off to everyone who is running infrastructure in order to support this level of increased usage and growth. Um, and so, you know, just a, a fraction of all IPFS users over NFT is actually, or over HTTP is pictured here. Um, there's also a lot of work that, oh, I, this is a, a snapshot into a couple of the different sites, um, Magic Eden, um, uh, PaintSwap, I, I know Board Apes is on there, a lot of other groups that are um, building, building uh, their marketplaces uh, on top of IPFS, which is awesome. Uh, one really, really useful thing that's coming, has, or I guess has come both to the IPFS network um, and to gateways in terms of making data more accessible is improving the IPFS and Filecoin indexing, discovery, and interop of content. This can be really useful for IPFS nodes in general so that they can utilize indexer nodes that want to uh, host and um, and kind of index into the content that their node is hosting that helps reduce a whole ton of um, kind of like annoying maintenance burden when it comes to interacting with the IPFS DHT. Um, there's also been a ton of work happening around delegated content routing to enable many different groups to plug in 
different forms of finding content, different algorithms, different um, strategies for scaling content discovery in IPFS. Um, and this also brings kind of new capabilities to IPFS as well in terms of offloading large chunks of static data uh, to Filecoin so that they can focus on just hosting hot caches of data and have all of that data being indexed and accessible to other nodes in the IPFS network. Um, I think this is actually recently rolled out to all Filecoin storage providers to be indexing their content and making it accessible to nodes that are uh, querying it from IPFS. Um, and so it's default as of the most recent Lotus release. Um, and there's a, a lot of bridging being done to make sure that these two networks smoothly connect with each other. Um, really, every Filecoin node is an IPFS node. We just need to make sure they're talking the same data transfer protocols. Um, and so there's a, a lot of exciting work being done there so that everyone who is building and storing really useful archives and data sets on Filecoin can also build amazing IPFS front ends that say operate over all of the map data or internet archive data or video data that's being stored there. Um, um, and so a lot of amazing work uh, being done by the Bedrock team. Um, if you also want to get involved, this delegated uh, content routing support is in the works and is a very useful opportunity for many people who want to maybe build their own content routing um, strategy and use that within their own kind of sub-network of IPFS or even make this something that all IPFS net nodes can support and benchmark and validate that it's an improvement upon our current um, uh, content routing strategies. And so definitely an opportunity for many folks to get involved if we have some builders in the house uh, that want to start trying to utilize that API to, to push things forward. So that's, that's my overview and my spotlights. I'm really excited for the next time we chat. In, in the meantime, ways that you can stay connected, follow us on YouTube and Twitter, join the IPFS Discord. There's a growing and thriving community on Discord. I'd highly recommend getting involved. Uh, I hang out there all the time. Um, definitely subscribe to the IPFS Weekly Newsletter. It has a great index of all of the, the cool new projects that are being created. Um, and come to upcoming events like Paris P2P uh, that's happening next weekend. Um, and speaking of upcoming events, early, early preview, we're actually going to be hosting IPFS Camp 2022 here in Amsterdam in July. Um, we did the last one of these, I think, in 2019, so it's been too long, darn you COVID, um, and really, really excited to get the IPFS community back together and have a ton of talks and presentations and workshops um, from all of the amazing groups that are pushing the network forward, building on top of it, have good strategies or infrastructure that other groups can learn from and, and build on. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much. Feel free to connect with me on Twitter. I'm omac 28 um, And yeah, uh, we'll turn it over to Constantine for what's next.